Hey there, AGA members. Chris Garlock here with Michael Redman. We've got a very special treat for you today. Michael is going to take a look at a classic game for history and how it connects to uh, games played by AlphaGo, actually a very specific game played by AlphaGo. It's going to be really cool. You're going to love it. Uh, before we get into this fascinating game, however, we do want to ask you to consider joining the American Go Association at usgo.org. Org. It's the support of our wonderful AGA members, uh, which is what makes these videos possible. So if you enjoy them, and uh, judging by the comments, I'm pretty sure that you do. Uh, big thanks to all of those uh, who have joined and to those of you who will join. All right, Michael, I know you are itching. <laughs> Itching yeah. to get into this. Uh, those of you uh, uh, who are fans of Michael probably know he he loves Go history. He is. Um, I don't think it's too much to say that you're somewhat of an expert. You you've really you know delved deeply. You I think you 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 actually not just Go history. You you've read a bunch about uh, Japanese history as well. Japanese right? history is interesting also. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I, I wouldn't call myself an expert. I have a lot of interest. <laughs> like. Um, when I get into the details, like people who really are um, knowledgeable would be correcting me all the time. But um, I do have a, I think I have a general picture of what's going on. Fair enough. Fair and of enough. Of course, I have an, a great interest in the games. Um, and this time I chose this game uh, because there's a certain position in the middle game that mm -hmm. is just visually, it just um, quite recently we were doing a video for game 27 of yes. AlphaGo versus AlphaGo. And there's just this huge, similarity in the overall position. It's not as if they're playing the same moves so much as that they got into a very similar game um, all over. And so so when the time comes, I'm going to try to demonstrate that. Very cool. Hey, let's introduce the players first. We get This is cool. I mean, AlphaGo, we never get to talk about AlphaGo, the personality, because right. of course right. it's AlphaGo. <laughs> but right. uh, why don't, let's talk about the players. OK, Black is, the player with Black is Hoimbo Shua. Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, he's one of the greatest players in history of Go. Um, he didn't play a very flashy style. So um, he wasn't that popular. And um, so that's why he's not quite as um, famous as the more famous players such as Hoimbo Dosaku. Right. Or, of course, Gosegen more recently. Th those are the two people who were called the Gosens. And, of course, Hoimbo Shusaku. Absolutely. That's about everyone knows about. Uh, was the younger student, or you could say he was a student of Shua. Um, there wasn't that much difference in their ages. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, so they were, um, in a way, they were both students of the Hoimbo, Hoimbo school. Um, but Shua acted as a kind of a teacher for Hoimbo. Mm -hmm. um, and Shua was very long lived. He played a lot of games. Um, so there's a lot of his games in history. Um, and he was spectacular throughout his life but he never became the Meijin. And the Meijin is a special title given to the strongest player um, of that era. And there's a lot of um, extra value to that. That you, you are, um, uh, the, um, the player who controls the Go world and sort of the connection between the Go players and the government, which was supporting Go. Um, and so there's a lot of power uh, attributed to the post of Meijin also. And Shua's teacher, Hoimbo Joa, was the Meijin. Um, but uh, people didn't like him very much. Like there were, uh, especially the, uh, the opponent that Shua has right now, um, Inoue Inseki. And um, with the Inoue uh, school, the leader of the house always calls himself Inseki. Mm -hmm. So like you have uh, a couple dozen Insekis to deal with, and so the way people the way people differentiate is they give them an extra name for the name using the name that the player uh, used after he retired mm -hmm. because uh, Japanese go players in that time would retire often they became um, or pretended to become Buddhist monks there, there were sort of Buddhist monks um, formally to start with right they, they shaved their heads and stuff um, so they would take a Buddhist name. And so that's why this person is called Gen Genan in Seki. Mm -hmm. And so I, I put just one N in the Genan, but it could be two Ns in the middle of there, um, just, just to make it easier for English speakers to, to pronounce it. 
Right. And because that, that N is sounded. And any particular stuff we should know about him as as we go into this? Well, he was um he was an author of books. Um mm-hmm. he, he, he was very interesting in his books because he would um he would be uh he would talk about himself and he would say mm. his game was, was completely hopeless up to the age of forty or something like that. And I can relate. Like that. He's he's very amusing in the way he comments on his own games because uh-huh. um, he's very negative about his own his own play most of the time. But um, he's more famous um, because he was in a kind of a political rival of Hoimbo Joa, the teacher of Hoimbo Shua, and he right. tried to dethrone him a few times with no success. He he lost to Joa, and he had a lot of schemes in where he tried to um, dethrone Joa from the Meiji title. Um, it didn't work out. And um, in some of his writing, he he tells stories about terrible things that Joa did to become Meiji. <laughs> and no one really knows um, if they're true or not, but maybe they are. <laughs> so that it's, it's, it's hard to say. Makes um, for a good story. He makes some good stories. So a very colorful personality. Um, after he sort of retired, he, he tried to go to China to, to be a Go player in China also. So, but then that was a period of time when you're not supposed to leave Japan. So he, he uh-huh. didn't succeed in that either. Well, we'll uh, uh, these, it's a lot of really, that's a very good sort of uh, short version of both of those. I'm not you're, finished, you're, you're, Chris. Oh, you're not finished? <laughs> oh, okay. I, I thought you were, I thought you were, because I, I know you wanted to get into the game. Um, was, he, keep he's going, most keep famous going. for his game against Shusaku, actually. Yes. Uh, because Gian Yuseki played the, a game against Shusaku. Again, it was part of his schemes to become, to, to become the next Meiji. Um, he wanted to show how he was, he wanted to test out Shuzaku to see if he could beat him with uh, the white stones. Mm-hmm. And actually, they, the, the rank was, there was a big difference in their ranks. So they started with a game at two stones. And uh, Shuzaku simply creamed him. So <laughs> uh, the next day, he said, you can play with black, which was already um, a smaller handicap than he was supposed to get, according to the ranks. And and they played the air reddening game, the famous air reddening game. Oh, of course, that's yeah. right. Of course. And you might recall that in that game, Inoue Inseki, Genon Inseki, played a version of the Taisha Joseki, mm-hmm. which was new. Um, some people call it a trick play. He played he played a special version of that Joseki that um, worked really well, and um, he had an advantage in that game up to even after. Shuzaku played the ear reddening move actually. Mm-hmm. So that's an interesting move, game we could get into at some point also. So oh, really I fun. think so. I think so. It took, it took a lot a lot of work for Shuzaku to win that game. Mhm. Okay, to get into our game today. Um, Just wanted to mention we will include links so that those of you who uh, want to get more into the the details. Michael's being very good cuz he could do he could probably do a whole session on on both of these players. So we'll put links to yeah, both I, of them. Oh, I'd love to do that. Yeah. <laughs> you are. Um and so this this game is one of a, a set of three games, you might say. They, they mm. call it a challenge match of three games. Um, there was some time between the games because Gan was sort of giving up on the idea of beating Shusa, Shua. At, he was playing with no Komi as white. At this time, Genan was what we would now call an eight Um At the time, I think it was called Jun Meijin. So he was second to Meijin. Um, and... So in, in today's ranks, uh, the Meijin would be a nine don, mm. and the Jun Meijin would be an eight don, and mm-hmm. Shua was a seven don. So the handicap there is that um, Gena has to take white in two out of three games. But in order to challenge Joa, he wanted to start by demonstrating that he could beat Shua with white, mm-hmm. just to show his superiority. And he lost all three games. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. So that's where they stopped playing that challenge match. It was probably supposed to go on a bit further. Mm. So we see Gan or he's playing the Taisha Joseki, the big mm-hmm. uh, knight's move. Um, and he has played this earlier against Shua also. And Shua knows that um, Gan is an expert at the fighting fighting version of this Joseki. So um, that would be this one. And so I, I ask you to look at the black stone in the upper left corner. Shua has played this stone in anticipation of the idea that Gena might be playing this fighting Joseki. Because when we get into the, I'm just going to show the main version. Like I, I could do hours and hours just about the Taisha Joseki. 
because there is a multitude of variations. Um, but this is the main variation, in which case the placement of that stone at A is working well with Black's group on mm -hmm. different sides. It's, mm -hmm. a good, it's relatively easy to connect up there. Um, of course, uh, white B there, why don't we just go back to that move? Uh, white B there, this is the turning point. Um, it's it's the, the crossroads of this Josie where white has a lot of choices. Um, so white could have um, could have pushed here. Actually, this is the move that Zen likes to play. Um, or white could have extended here. And all of these Joseki, already they were being very thoroughly studied and continued to be studied um, up to a few decades ago, I guess. And it's not so common nowadays. Can you talk Although just this, a, no, just yeah. a little bit because you had the four schools and and you know. Uh, some folks either know the Josekis or certainly know that there are Josekis, but these were things that were were being developed, you know, at that. This is, you know, hundreds of years ago. They didn't really exist before then, right? Um, yes, and no. These, Actually, yes and no, right? You could go to ancient China, um, where they're still playing with the um, four stones on the board to start the game. Right. Uh, they, they had their own Joseki studies then. Mm. And they were, they're pretty good, actually. They're pretty good um, in the context of uh, having those two stones each placed on the board. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they were starting with mostly with star points, Joseki, of course, um, because that's where the stones were placed. Mm. So, so they were sort of limited most of the time to star point Joseki, except when they had a handicap game. Because right. if they had a three stone handicap game, they would have open corners. So they had some um, modern Joseki, you might say, also. Mm -hmm. um, and this uh, this changing of the joseki, um, finding new moves and stuff, was going on throughout history. So it's, mm -hmm. it, it's probably as old as Go itself is. Um, and so they, they were doing a lot of new stuff in Edo era, that's 300 years ago, just because uh, they were um, sponsored by the Japanese government, the Bakufu, the central government of Japan, which started the Edo era, um, was sponsoring Go, as well as um, all sorts of Japanese culture. Um, and the fact that the players could spend 100% of their time just studying Go sure. made it very easy. They, they were sponsored. They, um, they didn't have to worry about gaining money and stuff. And so there was a lot of uh, progress made, but also a lot of it was secret because they had these four houses right. and um, they studied within the schools. So they had the four schools that they studied with other members of the school. But there were certain um, special moves that they had that were mm -hmm. secret until they had some important game where they were going to use it, and that was one of one of those moves was the moves that with the move that Garen used against Shusaku. Right, the, right. Uh, air reddening move, uh, but he he played a special move against uh, Joa too, mm -hmm. um, and he he got an advantage in that game. It didn't pan out in that game either. <laughs> so much for <laughs> special moves, right? Well. Um, I think that was the game where Joa played three, um, three fantastic moves. It was famous for the three fantastic moves that Joa played. So oh. Joa did an outstanding performance in that game. But um, so in in the in the complicated variation, well, this is the main variation of the fighting fighting Joseki. Uh, we we can see that Black is sort of prepared by playing that move at A. So Shua is, is ready for um, Ganon's fighting style because he does tend to have the fighting style. And so now uh, jo, uh, Shua plays the, the bamboo joint here. Um, it's interesting. Th this variation sort of depends on the ladder because white can push through and cut. And when the ladder at A favors, uh, favors white, and obviously there's nothing in the lower left part of the board, so it favors white in this case. When the ladder favors white, it's supposed to be good for white. Basically, uh, this would be bad for white if the ladder was good for black, but uh, white's going to take in the ladder. It's, going to be a disaster, right? Yeah. So Oops. so Black would probably have to play something like this. Maybe we'd get something like this, actually. And it wouldn't be a complete disaster for Black, but it would be um, playable for White. Mm. Um, so it's supposed to be bad for White, for Black to do that. Um, and so this is the move that was played at the time. This was the Joseki at the time. And it's interesting because I've marked a point which has become the modern Joseki, push on the top. Mm -hmm. and so if you look up this position um, at this position, if you look um, at just modern games the last few years, you'll see that Black is um, quite often pushing at the mark point. 
which is a, a variation of this Jose that was not uh, did not exist in the Edo era. Hmm. Well, this game was uh, played in the early 1800s, so the 19th century. So it's only about 200, um, almost 200 years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, but of course, the, the whole era had been going on for about 100 years already. Right. Um, and white pearls and black plays an extension. Um, and this is actually about even, I think. Um, people, uh, at some point, people were saying that this peep is peeping a bamboo joint, which is supposed right. to be bad. Um, uh, so people, at a certain point, people were saying that this is good for black. But I think it's changed around a little bit. It's, it looks like it's playable for white, too. What do you uh, think of, of the... the fact that white got the corner. When no, I was just going to ask yeah. what the uh, what you think of the placement of the black stone in the upper left now, given this particular Joseki. Uh, it's still, it's not necessarily bad. Okay. Um, you'll see that um, if it was a bad move, it would be good for white to sort of grab the corner territory at this mm-hmm. point mm-hmm. and say the black point. It's not, it doesn't turn out that that's quite true. And uh, that wouldn't be Ginnon style anyway. So we'd see him playing from the outside. Which uh, which makes it just fine for black to take the corner territory. Okay. And so this is about even. Um, I, I'd say this move is sort of characteristic of Gian. He did he did like to play the Moyo style, um, not always, but uh, sometimes he would like to play the Moyo style. So, so this is a very center oriented move, um, which is usually not played so early, but it's. Um, it's a sort of an alpha go like move, I, I'd say. It, well, it, it is um, not, it's taking the outside, it's taking influence. It's um, fascinating to see that too, and, and, and leaving two perfectly good corners left completely unplayed, right? I mean, we don't, we don't need right. those at the top of the board, right? Well, <laughs> yeah, that's the feeling that we have here. <laughs> and of course, there is a direct uh, threat of um, playing at A. If yes. white plays at A next, it's trouble for black. So black right. answered that. And uh, so this works well. Um, the knight's move that White just played works well with White extension on the upper side. So White's trying to build a moyo here, a big sphere of influence. Um, and so here, now, now we see this is uh, Hoimbo Shua's style. He plays very solidly. And it's, it's hard to see exactly what he's trying to do because he's so, so passive in the early points, parts of the game. And he's... He basically um, immediately starts to simplify, tries to simplify the game. He likes to simplify the game because he knows he has a big advantage as black with no komi. Mm-hmm. And he plays very, very simply. I don't really agree with this move, but um, as I'm going to say later in this game also, it's really hard to disagree with Shua when he's so successful doing what he does. Like he, sure. he plays these passive moves and you think he's being slack. It's, it looks really stupid. And he easily wins. <laughs> say, say, say what you really think, Michael. Yeah, really. It, it looks really bad sometimes, especially <laughs> this move is a move that I really don't like. Sure, um, it's but he, banging he can up take, against the stone. He, right. And he plays these moves and he takes it to a win very uh, solidly sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, it doesn't happen that easily this game, though. Um, th- I'm going to, I made a variation to show what I think should be played. Right. And White will push. This is White's right. idea to build on the upper side. Uh, but black can still uh, float in maybe somewhere around uh, somewhere around here. Maybe there's that knight's move that white has on the right is still just a little bit weak. Uh-huh. So, so it's not as if it's going to be some huge moyo. And black has good positions on both sides. So this is this would be okay for black. But it does demonstrate what white's idea is. So uh, Suwa is just so trying to... Um, there, I don't really see why he has to play that move, but he, he plays this move. He's... Um, He's not giving so much momentum to white, you might say, in this group. Mm. And so uh, Gannon plays here. Um, maybe I would, I agree that the lower left corner is bigger than the lower right corner. If we're going to take a corner, I would take the lower left corner. Just um, a question here. I mean, again, it, that seems like a very alpha go to, I mean, playing, he played those two approach moves in the upper left mm-hmm. and then plays clear across the board. Yeah, well, these these two stones um, are stones that White is already thinking of sacrificing. Sure. And that that's a very that's um, AlphaGo might think so, but it's also a very human way to handle them. Also. Mm. Um, 
I sort of have my doubts about White's um, playing the five four point. Um, so I did mark A to show where I think I might have played. Okay. Uh, so um, okay, so I I, I uh, put this uh, position through Zen actually, uh -huh. um, and it's a it's okay. Um, there's an issue of Komi, so I did it um, with no Komi, and of course Black's good, but mm -hmm. even with Komi, it's still okay for Black at this point. It's not so bad. Um, and Zen was suggesting Black should just dive in here once. Right and away. Is, yeah. Well, this is looking at the weak point here. Um, right. 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 And so locally, just to show what the idea is, locally Black can continue with this and um, just cut that stone off. Or Black could have played away uh, with, at, at this point. When If White plays underneath, Black could just play away, maybe play something in the corner. Um, something like this would also be feasible. Um, but that, that would be a good point to, to be jumping into White's Moyo. Um, but it's really interesting that Hoinbo Shua doesn't do that. Um, I think... Um, I think that Hoingo Shua wants to leave more potential mm. to, to dive deeper, maybe, into White's Moyo. And he, he thinks this exchange here, while, out, while Zen was thinking that this exchange simplifies things and is good for Black mm. and reduces White's potential, I think Hoingo Shua was uh, thinking it was a bit of a waste of potential. So, um, so I, I can um, understand that. But actually, this move is... Um, even from human I the ideas of how to play the opening, this is probably bad hmm. because it's a bit too low. Like um, a modern player would probably play in the lower right corner. Um, so maybe maybe something like this. Or or actually, since White's played a 5-4 point, Black could jump into the lower left corner. And that would be a, a, a valid move too. White would probably answer locally. Um, or even play in the 3-3 three, three point um, here. So that's why I, I, I sort of like these moves for black. That's why I don't like the five four point for white in this opening. Um, but playing low on the side here, it's just um, it's just inviting the shoulder hit, mm -hmm. which you should recognize having go going through all of those games from AlphaGo. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and you know this is this is sort of the obvious move, uh, and always was for human. Pros also. It's not that um, AlphaGo invented the shoulder hit to the point that we didn't sure. have this move before. Um, it's a very natural move for White to play, and it already looks like White's going to be able to um, to, to pair this move up with building on the upper side. And so I'm going to show you how I think that happens. Actually, it worked with the game too. But um, Black plays an extension. You can see again Hoinbo Shua. He's not very exciting in the opening of the game. He usually just takes territory um, and runs away with it. And so this is a very nice tesuji here where white is, um, obviously it would be bad to be playing from the other side and just pushing black into the upper side. That would be yeah. the worst way for white. Yeah, so terrible. So um, conversely, this is now the best way for white to play. Uh, creating a weakness. White's going to throw away the marked stones. Right. But white also is creating a, a weakness um, at this point. I'm going to mark the point where white is so white is creating mm -hmm. a weakness there to um, to dull blacks moving out into the center. So mm -hmm. to demonstrate that, I, I'm this is where Ganon played. He got a bit excited, I think, at this point, <laughs> and it got really exciting game. But I, it made the game very interesting. But I, I'd say it's probably better just to push through here once um, and then play the nice move because white's yeah. threatening to push through it. Yeah. Again. Yeah. And so if black backs up here, then white can answer on the upside. That and feels very very unsatisfactory for black to have to back up like that, doesn't it? Well, black could take the three stones, but that would be hurting black on the on the left side. So yeah. for instance, first of all, uh, doing stuff like this is probably too dangerous because uh, right. white could push through and for instance, play here and here. And at this point, the black group is dead. Yeah, yeah. Um, so black would be sacri uh, cutting there doesn't really work. Um, so that's why I have black backing off Otherwise, black could uh, capture the three stones with something like this, but it's not really going to uh, do that much good for black because it's going to have a bad effect on, on the right. lower side. Um, white might, might not cover here immediately. White, white could get away with pushing here, um, just building on the center. And black would have to add another side, to the, another move to the left mm -hmm. side. It would yeah. be um, a, bother, a bother thing. And so, so that's how I would play the, the knight's move here. 
seems much better. But it's a it's a, a move that um, is not it's not as um, forcing forceful as this move you might say. So um, Gan chose the more forceful move, and I think I know what he had in mind. But it was maybe a bit of an overplay. Like at this point, it's like they're both uh, chasing each other in ladders. But this is really pushing black out into the center. So there's a yeah. negative aspect there also. And this is the move that Ginan, I think, wanted to play. This is a, a very nice clamping move. Um, you saw a similar move in my game against I was Joe, just thinking that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which is also pretty recent. We did the video. Yep. Yep. Um, and if black connects here, in this case, black doesn't have to connect it. But if black connects here, then white does get the cover from above and has a nice shape in the center. So mm. in this position, white would be pressuring black on the left a little bit and would have, um, it would be likely that white could connect up to the lower left corner to make a kind of a wall. And also white is threatening this honey in the center uh, over here. Right? So white can, white can still pressure that black group of stones that's uh, jutting out into the center now. Would, would you say that kind of crawl, uh, crawling along there, that caterpillar shape, is that more of a classical style? I mean, because because I'm I'm totally with your knight's move. I mean, that just seems you know you want to be it's, fast, it's, right? This is this is pretty unique to Ganon. Okay. Um, okay. He likes he likes sort of contact play. He, he yeah. Likes to have things, um, uh, you can almost hear the stones crushing against each <laughs> yeah. other. Um, and whereas he, he he didn't like the loose moves like this so much, but I think in this case this is more effective. Yeah, I like it too. Yeah. And he, I think he had the feeling that he had to, against Shua, he had to fight. Mm -hmm, like every mm -hmm. time he played Shua, he would be bullying Shua throughout the middle game. And they would end up, it would be very close and Shua would, would win by a small margin. That was mm -hmm. sort of the pattern of their games. Like uh, one of the first games he played against Shua, an earlier game he played against Shua, again, he, he seemed to catch up. And I, I bet he thought he was winning, but he ended up losing by one point. Mm. Um, so I think he was, I wouldn't be surprised if he had a phobia about close games against Shua because he was losing yeah. just about every time. Um, so he, he probably thinks he has to fight. And so you can see he's, he's, um, sort of building that kind of a game, but of course Shua knows how to fight too. So black pushes through, um, this is what some people would call the Kiai move, the fighting spirit move. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, it's very natural. It's sort of mandatory in this position because this would just be too easy for white. Right. And so white pushes through. And so this is the point where I think it's sort of demonstrated that white's strategy is not really working all that well. Yeah. Because black is jetting out straight into the center. That's a very nice way for black to be moving out into the center there. And white does have some counterplay, but like if white just pushes through here, it, this is going to be dangerous for white white stones on the side. That's just not going to work. Um, so that's bad for white. So instead, white um, is going. White play finally plays this exchange. It does. This does work to um, ex to to make stronger the threat here, and that's going to play come into play. It's going to going to come into play later, okay. and then white cuts here. Oh, I was wondering about that. So um, while I question the, uh, the move, uh, let's go back to it again, uh, the pushing move here. All of these pushes, I question them. It's also true that I recognize that um, Genan was already looking at this. At, um, this was sort of naturally progressing from, from all of those pushes that White played here on the, on the is this the sixth line? Um, these moves were leading up to this cut. So he, he had put a lot of thought into it and it was leading up to this sequence. And of course, just to make the easy, get the easy variation first, cutting here and trying to capture the two stones doesn't work because the ladder's good for white, obviously. Mm -hmm, and if mm -hmm. black backs off now, it, it's just, it makes it easy for white. So cutting at A is a bad idea. So instead black curls around immediately. And that means that uh, next black can take from underneath. So white has to go straight down here and then black can crawl. So this is where it starts to involve a lot of reading. Because, yeah. Uh, uh, it's a it's going to be a semi act. Wow. So first of all, let's look at uh, white just pushing through. This seems to be the safe move. But black's going to crawl once more. Yeah. White's going to connect. 
And it's important that now Black has time to connect on the fifth line here. That's a very important move. Wow. And now the left side and, um, and well, the left side and the left side are Mi. There's two points. In, <laughs> so first of all, White has to protect these two stones. Otherwise, oh they would be captured. Yeah. Uh, like, for instance, if White plays, uh, let's say, if White plays something like this, um, White has three liberties and Black has four liberties. So White right. loses that. Um, so, so if White uh, pushes through here, then Black can just uh, close White off in the center. And although there's a lot of space there, um, it's, it's bad for White because Black just has more eye space. It's sort of interesting that any move inside here would uh, lose or become a cope. Mm. But Black can actually just push from the outside and let White capture that one stone because Black pushes from behind. Oh, so wow. this is a point where some players would get confused and maybe play something like this. Right. Which would end up being a cult. This would, this would actually be a cult. Uh, but it turns out Black can just push from outside. That's cool. So, um, so White covers. So it, it looks like this sacrifice of covering on the third line is necessary to save both of the marked groups. So Black has to cut now. Um, otherwise, like if Black played underneath, uh, White would connect here. And this time, White's going to win the seminary. Ooh, so, collapse. And, so if Black continues uh, by connecting on the side, now White has the cut here. So like, for instance, White could, uh, let's make it exciting by cutting first and then playing here. So this would be bad for Black. There would also be the problem in the corner here with the cut here. There would be a squeeze there where White would at the very least be getting, um, well, it looks really troublesome with um, stuff like this on the side, actually. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm just improvising this. Um, so don't take my word for it, but if, oh, if we get oh, this far, yeah. It's, yeah, if we get this far, it's already bad for Black. Yeah. yeah. Um, so something like, like that could be happening. There's a lot of bad Aussie in the corner, just to, to paraphrase, you might say. So Black has to cut, yeah. Um, and white plays this move. Um, this is the good shape move to save the five stones. White has to save That's these nice. five stones yeah. in the center. Um, otherwise, white could have pushed. Um, Zen actually sort of liked this move too. Huh. Um, but I, I don't really understand that completely. This is definitely the more exciting looking move. Um, and if black extends here, of course, white can uh, win the semi with this move. This is important in that it, it fills a black liberty. And if, if black cuts underneath, um, white can still continue. Oh, sorry about that. Black didn't need to play that move. Um, so white can, can squeeze like this, and black's just dead. Too good. So um, so black's not going to cut there, but actually black is going to play this tray from the side. And then black can squeeze from the center. This is actually not so bad for black. Um, in a no coming game, it, it looks like it's still uh, an advantage for black. Um, but Hoin Boshua just, he really liked to take territory, especially when he had black. Um, mm -hmm. he, um, he, I'm sure he had the idea that that simplified the game, and I, it probably does, um, to, just to take territory, to take a, establish a territorial lead and leave the responsibility for attacking to his opponent. So he, he probably didn't like this just because white was getting the territory on the side in this variation. So black didn't allow that. Um, but push through. So extending here is maybe the good shape here, move here. And pushing through is, in a way, it's helping White, but it does get Sente. Um, because White wanted to push through here anyway. So this is sort of helping White to be doing it, um, forcing White to do play that move that White wanted to play anyway, just mm -hmm. by playing an Atari. So, so this move, in a way, locally, uh, pushing through here helped White. But it did give Black Sente. So black gets to take the side. So at this point, white's group on the side is dead. And uh, white connects and black uh, black plays at A because um, black could have taken from underneath with B. Why don't I do that in a variation? Black could have played underneath. Um, this actually gives black more territory, but it does have the weakness that white can push, can, can cover on the top here. And this is go going to be forcing. Like, um, you, you could have, uh, eventually you could have white doing well. Um, just ignore what's happening on the left side. But we could have white uh, doing something like this. 
and squeezing from the center, um, which would be okay for white. It would it would establish this huge moyo on the upper side. Yeah. So there's this idea for white, and by connecting on the on the fifth line here, black takes away that option. Um, and the left side it looks sort of scary, but black's going to win by one move. And I put that variation in uh, later, so we're gonna we're gonna look at it later. So white saves the marked stone, um, the the stones on the side. White, white has to save them, and black uh, plays here. Um, let's see what was this variation. Yeah, I've already done that one. And so so we get to this position. So now white has taken some territory in the lower left, and black has taken the upper left area. Um, but white has this weak group in the center. So I don't think this is really being a, a great success for white because black is um, attacking that weak group in the center or has potential to. And so uh, for the time being, white is surrounded the upper side. And so Shua plays here. Now, this is a move that would never occur to me. It's, it's hard to believe. It's again a position where I say that it's only because Shua has um, this great ability to calculate the game Mm. And, and to, he's confident of his ability to take this to the end because he knows he's already got an advantage um, in the context of a no komi game. Um, he doesn't have to pay komi, so he knows he has an advantage. And he's continuing to put the pressure on White's group in the center. Okay, I see that. Uh, but from my viewpoint, this looks like a really slack move. It's certainly slow. I mean... <laughs> yeah, and I... you know, uh, this game has been um, commentated by a number of professional players and I'm pretty sure that just about everyone found this move to be slack. But um, we sort of hesitate to say that because <laughs> we know that Shua can make it work. <laughs> right. And he plays these very, very solid, stupid looking moves. I, I'm sorry to say stupid so many times. He's, he's a great player and uh, highly respected. But um, that's the way the, on, on the face of it, that's the way the moves look to me. Um, and it's really the astounding part of it is that he makes them work. So right. um, I marked A to show, like, I, I would be wanting to play uh, the attachment at A. So just to show you something like this. And and the more white um, answers back to this, the more trouble white's going to get into in the center. Like, white white has two sides that white has to play on. So this would be a lot of, um, it would be a very busy variation for white. And black would have a lot of fun um, playing around with this. Um, but I, I, I bet Sue, I would say that... Um, Allowing white to establish that territory is not what he had in mind. Like that, that now we know that the upper side is white's territory. So mm -hmm. black, there is a negative aspect in that white is getting some territory here. So he plays very slowly here, gradually putting pressure on white. And again, he plays another show, a slow move at A. Um, it wasn't really necessary, but it is a vital point in the shape of black's group. So he, he's just making a very solid group there and saying, what are you going to do with those stones in the center? And it is true that at this point of the game, black does have an, an advantage. Mm. Um, looking at the game, it looks like black has an advantage. And um, and Zen's assessment agreed with me there. Um, so white plays this capping move. Um, now this is, it looks, it looks like a good move. Like white is trying to reinforce the center and um, is um, sort of threatening black on the right side, threatening to press down on black. Um, it's interesting that Zen wanted just to play at A with white to force black to answer at B. And then Zen wanted to play something um, in one of the lower side corners. So maybe maybe another move. Um, I'm with Zen. Uh, a move here would be a big move mm -hmm. in the lower left corner. Or, or uh, in the lower right corner, I think actually um, it depends on the center. Like the center is in danger, so maybe I'd play a star point. Um, otherwise... Um, with all of these blacks, with that black stone on the side, the three three point would locally it would be the best move. Only hmm. it's a bit it's a bit too far from white's weak group in the center. Maybe. Yeah. Um, so some 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 big point would be uh, feasible, but um, this move is sort of helping white's group in the center. It looks it looks reasonable to me. Another slow move by Shua, like he's saying, well, <laughs> this is actually this is actually pretty big because black can jump in at eight. Right. Right. At least but, it has um, a follow up. Yeah. So you're and not gonna call that you're not calling that stupid, you're just calling it slow. It's slow. I I I've um I've reached my quota of stupid. <laughs> <this game. laughs> 
And so, uh, so this is the attachment that White was aiming at. And almost uh, unanimously, everyone has criticized this move by Gemma, that this move is said to be an overplay. And um, that's partly because it just didn't work out. Mm. But that was, um, that was because of spectacular play by Hoenn Boshua. Like once the opponent starts to try to attack, he really shows his fighting abilities. Um, up to that point, he doesn't really like to attack on his own, but he, he likes to be attacked. And then he starts fighting very strongly. Hmm. Um, so White should have just pulled back peacefully and being satisfied with um, having Black in a low position here. And then White could play away. So this is the variation that um, I have suggested. Black does have the, the move at B where Black can reduce White's moyo. Um, but uh, like uh, something, this is what, what White played in the game. Something like this would happen, and White will get most of the territory on the third and fourth lines. So it's not as if the White group is going to get killed or anything. But instead, Genan played here. Um, and we have this ko about to start. So White's argument would be that White has co threats on the left side, that dead White group. Sure. Um, so, and at this point of the game, if Black starts the co, Black didn't start the co. If Black starts the co, um, moves on the upper side are probably not forcing. So like if we have this variation um, and then Black plays something like this, it's not forcing anymore. And Black has lost a lot on the right side. So this would be okay for White. Um, so Shua doesn't start the co and in not, actively starting the ko, uh, he manages to put a lot of pressure on white. So he starts with this move. So locally, um, if white plays the cut here, this is already very, very dangerous. Like, um, it's also super complicated. But um, <laughs> for the time being, uh, white's connection here with the two space jump and the knight's move here is, is a bit weak. Yeah. So, um, so it's so we could get into that and it would be complicated. But to keep things relatively simple, um, to hold things together, White really has to be able to win by playing on the outside like this, reinforcing the connection of his stones. In which case, Black will jump here, um, and a, a simplified version of the um, the semi. Uh, all of White's moves are forced. Black has a number of choices actually, but Black is playing the relatively simple way. And this uh, this becomes one key point, which reduces White's liberties. And the second key point is what is called the Sekito Shiboi, or the Gravestone Squeeze. Ah, um, right, 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 right. Which is this one. Um, and, well, in this case, I've given White an eye. It's the same result. Um, let's just go through this variation first. We see that White ends up losing by one move. Um, so White could continue by filling the liberty. And White is losing by one. Wow. And the reason it's called the Gravestone Shibori or the Gravestone Squeeze is because um, Black, this shape here where White has this blob of stones um, on the upper side is, is called the Gravestone. It, it, it's, it's similar to um, stones that people put on their graves in Japan uh, with, right. with a little block underneath. So it, we're looking at it upside down sort of. Uh, but these 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 six stones here form the block, which is uh, the base of the gravestone. And then there's a pillar, um, which has the name of the person or the name that was given to that person after he died or the name of the family. It can be, I, th I think it can be more, it's maybe it's usually the name of the family, but there's a plaque or it's carved into the pillar, um, the names. One of my favorite memories of, of uh, I think it was, might've been my first trip to Japan was when we got taken to, I think it was the uh, the graveyard at the Honimbo. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. So you got to see Honimbo suicide grave. I did, so, I did. Yeah, but so, the but these are. If people are thinking about Western gravestones, this is not what Michael's talking about because I, I was. It's a very different look. I mean, there's lots of stones as in a mm -hmm. graveyard, but they're very. So it, they're more like what we would call pillars in the West, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's this picturesque, and of course the block is. The um, the base here is where people put their offerings, so like flowers, 
Um, ghost some, ghost stones. Ghost stones. You could could put ghost stones. Um, some people put uh, beverages. Like if the person likes sake, maybe you put sake there. Um, but anyway, that's what the gravestone, the name of this uh, squeeze, um, is about. That shape and, there. And that in Japanese again is called the shicho. Sek, sekito shibori. Sekito, sekito, yeah, the the seki part is stone, and to is for a grave. Uh, a grave stone. Yeah. Got it. Uh, or a pillar. This uh, yeah. this this is looking. Uh, I see. I think I see where we're going with the uh, with the AlphaGo uh, thing. This is looking uh, very complicated. It's complicated. Yeah. Well, all of this fighting in the upper side of the. Um, it reminds me of the AlphaGo game. Actually, they played four cornerstones before starting the fighting, but it's very right. similar in that right. everything started in the upper. Side. Um, and I'm I'm going to be showing you that game later. Um, I haven't come to the point quite yet. So now black place is a t attachment. Um, and again, uh, there's two two ideas behind this move. One is that black is trying to create good co-threats for the code. A. Uh -huh. Black is still trying to create good co-threats. And out. Um, also, black uh, would like to find a way to move out into the center with that marked group. So I'm going to show you how that happens if white pushes through and black cuts. Uh, white's probably going to have to extend, um, and black can jump out. And even though white played a, a relatively safe move by extending in this direction, um, black still has a lot of Aji there with the peep at A and the cut at B. At the very least, that's going to be a, a horde of co-threats. Um, mm. But it's also there's also a potential squeeze from outside with the peep at A. And so in this case, um, even without doing the call, this white group on the right side um, is in just amount, just the same amount of danger as black is. So it's, it's more dangerous for white, you might say. And black doesn't even have to play that uh, call. It, it's it's more of a um, trouble. It's more of a problem for white to deal mm -hmm. with. Um, so that would be okay for black. So instead, uh, Gan plays very fights very strongly here, um, the strongest local move. Um, but in return, black is going to get a lot of co threats. So Queen Boshua continues here putting the pressure on black. So it, it's really interesting for me to see how he suddenly starts fighting very strongly. The moment Gan tries to attack, he starts to fight. Um, it's sort of the opposite of what you might expect. Mm -hmm. But he seems to be playing so timidly, but actually he was just uh, gathering strength uh, or potential, you might say, to make this attack more effective. So up to this point, what black has accomplished is Black has created a lot of co-threats starting from this move, the mark point, and also some potential against White in the center with this, this wedge here. So White is sort of overextended all over, um, but of course Black does have to play the co eventually. So uh, Black's going to play one Hane here and play the co. So now White doesn't have enough co-threats to win the co. So I made a variation where white tries to avoid playing the call. Uh, Gan continued to play the call, but what if white plays here? I was sort of interested to see how this would turn out. Hmm. Um, and looks like maybe white's going to capture that black group. It does, yeah. I couldn't find any good response to this move. Um, but that, because actually white's, white's pretty weak all over here. Like if white pushes through here, black's going to push through here. We can see that in the center there, white has terrible shape with the cut. Terrible. Uh, let's mark the cut. There's the cut here and the dummies Murray here. Right, right, right. Um, yeah. uh, black could cut immediately. Like if white played here, black could just cut here and it would already be bad. Uh, so I have white pushing through. Again, black pushes through here. And in this variation, I'm just having him cut here. Yeah. And it's already bad. It's, it's white's just losing. Um, so it's pretty amazing how effective how effective uh, this key point here, this one. Yeah, this one is. is. Um, yeah. Because just taking the two stones, although it might give black life, it wouldn't be very satisfactory. Black's going after the whole white group and sort of looking at looking at this wedge here. So it's, it's more trouble than it, it's good for white. It's, mm -hmm. it's just bad for white, maybe. So white continues the call. And white does have all these call threats here. So is this, I, I, I can't find where I made the variation to show this Temer on the left side, so I'll show it to you now. Okay. Um, so first of all, if white plays the squeeze, which is the normal Tetsuji here, let's just go back a few moves. 
let's start to have white play this one. This, this is the easy one where black has four liberties and white has only three. So, so cutting, cutting here on the, on, the, um, on the second line, cutting on the second line is the tesuji here. And if white continues with the squeeze, then black is just going to win by curling there and white just loses those five stones. Right. So uh, the move that looks better for white is to play here and then here. And usually this would be a ko. Like if black plays here, then white can play here. This looks like black's going to lose. But it turns out that when white plays this move, and, and so the ko would be black playing here and white playing here and black filling the liberty maybe to, to get a call. But in actual play, black can, um, can cut on the third line or force with this move, just either one works. White has to answer on this side. That means that black has an extra liberty because white cannot immediately play an Atari here. So black's gonna win by one move. Wow. So, so that forcing move, uh, why don't I wanna just mark the forcing move in this position. This, this forcing move that black has here enables black to win the semi. So for the time being, um, it's just a win for black. But white was saving saving this area um, for, for cold threats because locally the end game move would be to play here. Um, but that would just lose all of the cold threats. So white was leaving that for the time being. Um, so white's just making some cold threats here. Plus the fact, plus the fact that um, in the process of losing that semi, white's gonna get a stone at the mark point which is going to change um, change what might happen in the lower left corner. Mm -hmm. That's that's what makes it possible for white to surround the lower left corner with the knight's move here, because white has this imaginary stone at B7, which is helping, which is going to help white kill, kill black when black comes into the corner. <laughs> um, so white, so black answers that. So white is just using the left side as co-threats, but black has so many co-threats here. So for a while, we're going to continue the call. But now, uh, this is where Shua ignores White's co-threat on the left side. Wow. So in fact, this place, the one cut here, which is just, um, it's not really necessary, but it's making, ensuring this forcing move here. So it's, it's making that, um, it's making sure that that's going to be forcing. He didn't really have to do that. but um, And then Shua plays, plays away again. So again, we see this point in the game where Shua is making use of Genan's original attack to set up an attack of his own. So uh, just the momentum of White's attack on Black in the upper right has started this big fight where it turns out Black is attacking White. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and the reason that Shua can do that is that he still has some co-threats on the upper side. And so once he has decided to ignore White's co-threat on the left, White doesn't have any co-threats left. So black can continue a bit in the center and white takes the call and black is just going to go ahead and win this call because black has co threats in the upper side. Um, and white plays another move here. So this is um, while white was losing if black had played first. Now this is going to be a call that is advantageous for black for, for white. Sorry. For white, yeah. It's, it's going to be a step call because black's going to uh, black can the fact that black can force with this move is not really helping that much. Um, why don't we make a variation? Yeah. Uh, let, uh, black, it does change it a little bit, the fact that black can play that move. Uh, let's do it this way. Let's, let's say uh, if black uh, fills a liberty, they're going right. to fight the call for a while. Okay. Um, and yeah, so at this point, white would not fill a liberty. White would just leave it. And... Um, and then black would eventually fill another liberty because black cannot connect here, obviously. Connecting would just lose. So right, 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 right. So it's a one-step call. Huh. Um, also, when black plays away, as black did in the game, and again, you see that black did not yet finish the call. Black still has enough call threats on the upper side. Um, when black plays away, uh, this is where the two stones, um, black's forcing move on the side comes in play because for the time being, it's going to be a, a call. But if white tries to deal with it without the co, white would maybe play here. Usually this would work, but again, uh, black can force with this move, fighting the co. Um, after white plays here, it's still a co. It, it's still the step co mm. here when black plays here. Um, 
white cannot win by pushing from this side. It's not white's not going to be in time. Um, so it's still going to be that call. So neither side will um, really gain any benefit from um, playing any of these points inside. Um, it's pretty pointless. Um, so it's so just to, so to speak. Yeah, so to speak. So it's just the call here that's going to be fought. And black will be pushing from the outside, but it's a step call. So it's already good for white locally. Mm -hmm. But the fact that black is not going to actually start it, it means that it's going to be hanging around throughout the game. Uh -huh. um, sort of like a headache. Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Because as the game progresses, we're going to see these stones that White has in the center. Uh, why don't I mark the group? This group here is going to get isolated. Uh, so this group. One more move, yeah. Yeah. So this group depends on winning a, the co on the left. Right. And for the time being, this White group has five liberties. So it's um, it has more liberties than the White group here on the side. So it's not really an issue as far as the semi is concerned, um, but it is uh, the added fact that if Black does eventually win this call, it's going to be a complete disaster overall in this area. It's going to be something like uh, 30 so points, maybe 40 points of Black territory, depending on how uh, many yeah, 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 open yeah. spaces, how, how much open space is attached to that white group. It's going to be close to 40 points when if Black does eventually win the call. Um, so white is continuing this co on the right side, um, and black still has co threats. And it, now it's a fairly easy co for black. It's turning into a hanami ko, um, and you can use this co threat because if white connects here, let's have white connect the ko in a variation. Um, black can squeeze to capture um, the left side, but you might notice that it hasn't saved black's group um, on the right, but uh, White's in so much trouble here in the center that um, that group is going to be okay also. Wow. So that's not a problem for Black. But this would be a good variation for Black. So instead, White answers the co-threats. White has to answer all of these co-threats. And White got a few co-threats in the center, but you can see that White group is still not looking so happy. And so finally, Shua finishes the call. Uh -huh. So finally, the call ends. And now we're going to see something sort of weird happen in a few moves. Um, this, this is making eyes. So at this point, white has um, an eye here and sort of has an eye here. So this eye, it sort of depends on various factors, the second eye. So it's, it's these two points that are going to be white's eyes. Um, black continues with the honey and white pushes. Uh, this is a Ooh. very big move. It's a big, finally an open corner. Right in the final open corner, finally. And this move, um, I can't believe that uh, Gail Inseki played that move. So this is the game record I'm working with. Uh, I think there might be some mistake in it. I was just um, going to ask. It's, it's possible, right? It's possible. Um, it's possible that, um, well, of course, these records um, were not computer data at the time. <laughs> they didn't have computers. Um, we'll talk a so, little bit about that. How, I mean, I mean, it's a really interesting. Uh, you see um, about how those records got made. I've, I've seen copies of some of the original records. Well, I think the in this case, it's a game between um, Hoinbo Shua and Gan Inseki. I forget what it might have even been uh, one of the extra games for a castle game. I, I think so, it, so. They would have an, the original game would have an original record taker. Or um, if the game were played even at someone's house, if it wasn't a castle game, they would still have a game recorder, um, especially when it was a game between um, two house leaders like this. Um, in a more um, casual game between professionals, sometimes they would be playing at a GoFan's house, or usually it was uh, someone in the aristocracy. But... Um, then maybe it would be the amateur player, the fan himself taking a record of the game, right. which would be uh, a possibility for a game record mistake in the original mm -hmm. record. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes uh, students of the school would be taking a, a record of the game, and in which case the original record is probably correct. But of course, uh, they had to hand copy those, those records. So throughout the ages, people would be hand copying them. And it's, um, so you, end up with actually you end up with a number of versions of the same game, game mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so there would be a version that the Hoinbo school 
had, and there would be a version that the Inoue school had. And if it's a castle game, I'm sorry, I don't remember in this case, but it's, if it's a castle game, there's an official record too. Um, right. And I'm not sure which one I'm looking at. I got I got this from uh, a database on the internet. Actually, I got it from SmartCo. Um, but <laughs> we love SmartCo. Uh, yeah, we love SmartCo. But this A, it it looks like a mistake, um, but it works with the final position. So I would assume that there was some um, in the fighting in the center. Maybe there was a different move order. That made it uh, in which it made sense, um, but I couldn't uh, I couldn't um, find a move order that worked. So it's just a mystery to me. Um, obviously, a bad move because yeah. um, there's no white already has five liberties, and so white's trouble in this semi with the the group on the left, uh, the the group that is going to be um, put into Atari is going to be this group on the left that white has. So, so it's sort of conceivable that White would want to extend liberties in the center, mm. uh, but in this case, it doesn't really have anything to do with it. Like the the group on the left is the one that has only three liberties, um, so that's the group that White has to worry about, which is going to be in a fight with the black group. With this group that has five liberties, um, these moves that Black would play to fill White's liberties, they're very very small. Like um, some of these moves are almost dame points. And and some of and like all of the moves that are still marked here, are only about one or two points each. Mm. This move would be closer to about five points, but um, most of these are very very small moves. So black doesn't get much joy by filling these liberties, and eventually white. If we say white wins the co, white would win the co anyway. So mm. all of the like if these moves were super efficient moves that accomplished a lot on their own, then black would be really happy to be playing these moves and forcing from the center while white had to capture the black group. But actually, mm -hmm. um, they're, they're not much different from the moves that black is playing here on the whole. So, so there's not really a good reason for white to want to play this move at this point in the game. Sure. Maybe, maybe, he, maybe it was played earlier. Though. So okay. that, that's my only, um, I couldn't find an order of moves in which it was a natural move. So that, that's, that's a problem that I haven't solved. Um, and actually, I found one more suspect move in this, so it might be a faulty game record. Um, yeah, which, which, which happened in, in, in those times. I mean, it was it, you know, it every, all, for, all, for all the reasons that you mentioned. So, mm -hmm. I mean, so to me, it's amazing is, yeah. that we have, you know, this is a game that, as you said, is what, uh, two, almost 200 years almost old. Almost 200 years old, yeah. So, certain data degradation could be uh, expected, possibly. I think this was the year that Hoingbo Joa retired. From the post of mm. of Beijing. Um, so late 1930s or something. Uh, I might be wrong, but I'm sure people would be able to correct me. Uh, we Eight, 18, 1830s. Late 1830s. 1830s. Yeah, yeah, 1830s. Yeah. Right. Okay. So White is still bothering with this group on in the center. Like, um, if White White could play away, and peeping here, if we assume the peep is forcing, then this is not completely alive, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so there is some issue with eyes. Once white plays here, it's it's pretty okay. Like, um, if black pushes through here, uh, almost always this is going to be forcing for white. And so, in a pinch, white actually can make eyes this way. White can play here, and um, and has a second eye here because black cannot. Uh, this zone would just be captured. Oh, nice. So white does have two eyes. Uh, white has to be careful there because with this move, if white just connects here, which looks pretty natural, um, black would have the option of taking away white's eye. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, if black starts, uh, so ideally black would start with this move and hope that white answers here, in which case black would be able to take away white's eyes. But um, once white has played, once white has played this attachment, um, if black peeps here, white can almost always play this with sente. And we realize that these two stones here, uh, they're not very valuable after all. Mm. So, so white can play this tari, so almost always going to be sente. Um, and so white has no problem living. So almost nice. always white can, it, I, I would say white is just about alive already. So that was an important move. It also reduces black's area in the lower, lower right. Black plays a kakari finally, um, white answers it. And here, 
Okay, so White finally answers at A. Now this this was always this position on the left side. It was a one step uh, one step call, and it was favoring White. But of course, we know now that if White loses this call, all of these stones um, just mark a few of them. All of these stones are going to die. Right. So that's already just in stones. It's uh, I think it's nineteen stones. Well, if we count if you count uh, the stone in, in here, it's nineteen stones. That's thirty eight points. And so just looking at the empty spaces, um, it's something like forty five points at least. Right. So that's that's huge. It would completely change the game, and it's actually bigger than um, Black's Moyo on the lower side. So at some point, White has to deal with that. So he added one move. And as I was saying, white, this doesn't finish things off. White black still has the one step co here when white does that, because white can't push from the side. So so white has to win the co, basically. So it's I guess it's about time for white to play that move. But as I was saying before, it's still there's still a co there waiting to happen. So this is what is slowing white down at, at this stage of the middle game. The fact that white has to play one move here. And eventually, we'll have to play another move there to finish that off. Mm. And Black adds a stone to the Moyo. White, uh, again, this is getting rid of uh, potential co threats um, by making the. This, this white group is now alive, even if Black plays two moves in a row. And, and that's ruling out moves like this. This would be answered, obviously. But um, like if Black plays here, Black would still have to, um, have to back, back up to this point. So. Pretty much alive, even if Black plays two moves in a row. Mm -hmm. So that that's getting rid of co threats. Um, now Black's only co threats are on the upper side in this area. Th these moves here would mm -hmm. be co threats. They would be bad co threats that, that Black doesn't really want to play. Um, and so Black doesn't have a multitude of co threats now. And so for the time being, the co is pretty much settled, and it's going to stay there for a bit more. Um, Black. Okay, that was my variation. So black plays here. So this is the board position um, that came to my mind when I was doing that commentary on game 27 of yep. AlphaGo. So I'm going to jump to a variation that I've made, which is actually game 27 from the self-played series of games. So just look at this position. Visually, okay. it's very, there's a very strong resemblance. So I'm going to switch screens to the AlphaGo game. It's even the same point that they played on. That is spooky. That is real. I see why you, and this is so cool because you spotted it right away. I remember, yeah. So it's this, this N6 move. It's exactly the same point that Black played. And it's a very similar Moyo there. So it's uh, it, the ghosts of Go haunt us. Yep. So I'll, I'll, I'll flash back to that position. It's like this. Wow. It's the same point. It's the same N6 point. Um, a very similar game. This is the AlphaGo game where they played a lot of fighting in the upper side. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. they ended up with this big Moyo on the lower side. It's so similar. Wow. And in this game, White's next move was here. And mark that it's H3. Um, and they, they started doing stuff here. And so Oh, this, I remember this. this. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's this yeah. stone at H3. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. AlphaGo actually played here, and then um, then it was like this, and like this. So it was something like that. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. this, this kind of trade. Um, so it's slightly different, um, but it was like like something like this, where where they made this trade, and Black was um, slightly different, but it, it's it's close enough, I think. Um, works works for me. I was trying to do that from memory. Um, but the, the H3 pos position of white stone here and the O3 position of white stone on the right side, again, that's just one space away um, because in the, in the Shua game, all of that is going to be one space over. So this is G3. It's one space to the left. And white's next move is N3. So that, was, that, that stone was O3 in the Wow. Game. So it's very similar. In fact, this game is even more cluttered on the upper side. It's more moves. It's, it's about 20 more moves that they played right. on the upper side. Right, right, yeah. Um, so it's a very strong resemblance. It's not as if they were playing a similar opening or a similar game. 
like right. the, the visual of this position is so was so similar it just struck me very strongly yeah no i think it's really cool and and it just goes i mean it's just come up uh a number of times the you know in looking at these alpha go games because you know there is a go history right i mean that mm-hmm. that that's you know and and just because it's an ai and and in fact you know uh i, I don't know that they put in I don't think they put in historic games. They put in a lot of human games, but I I don't remember. Do you remember if they if they put um, in any of the historic games? I don't think it was very clearly stated, but my, they, I think the implication was that they just used random games from the internet, and so it would not probably would not be historic games. Right. Right. Yeah. So, which to me makes it even more interesting. So, you know, the early versions, you know, had you know random human games, but not the historic mm-hmm. games. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and so to see these sort of allusions to the Go history, I don't know. I, I I'm with you. I, I find it very something yeah, well, very um, pleasing. Yes. Well, these historic games, even though the opening is different from the opening we play now, sure. Uh, there's there's a lot of general rules you might say or general ideas that are very valid in modern mm-hmm. code also that's why mm-hmm. we study these things yeah and, and that's that's why similar things are showing up in the ai games also i think yeah just and, because and they're I, valid they, they work yeah and i think you know people are studying AlphaGo now just like you know you're talking about these these folks at this time hundreds of years ago they were studying so to mm-hmm. me that's a, that's a similarity also and also, these games were very high quality because they didn't have time control. They were allowed oh, to spend right. as much time. That's when, when you see a move like this, um, there's a very high probability that it was a mistake in the record because uh, these players, they just don't make mistakes. Right. They right. have plenty of time to think about the game, and they spent more time studying than modern professionals can because they didn't have to worry about money or anything. They were mm-hmm. uh, sponsored mm-hmm. by the government. Um, and so they spent uh, a lot of time just setting go, and uh, the end result of their games was um, was more perfect than modern games, where you can expect a lot of mistakes towards the end of the game. There, there is that quality about these old games. It is, it is really beautiful. I think. Mm-hmm. I think this is part of your attraction to it. I would say. Yes. So here we see a position where, if this, um, to get back to the game. <laughs> We have this position where if this lower side becomes Black's territory, it's going to be a big win for Black. So just going back to this position here, um, sorry, at this position, I've, I've marked A, which is where maybe maybe it would have been an idea to play at A for Black. I think Black has a winnable position in this, in this even if Black plays a bit more conservatively. Uh-huh. Um, but um, I only say this because I, I've seen the game, I think. Because this seems a very natural move. Um, one would like to think that this is a black's territory. And of course, there is the, the possibility that white's going to chisel away from the corner um, or chisel away. Like white can maybe get a life in the corner like this, or maybe white can reduce the, the side territory a little bit with moves like this. Mm-hmm. Um, if you assume that white's going to be chiseling away from the side like this, with, um, with variations like this, um, then Black does want this stone to be um, as, as far out as possible, taking as mm-hmm. much as possible. Mm-hmm. And so at this point, when Black does try to make this territory, White actually has two options to dive in like he did in the game or to chisel from the sides like, like with moves like this. And, and that's why it's really hard for Black to decide between this move and a move like A, which would make it easier for White to play from the sides. Uh, play stuff like this to reduce instead of mm-hmm. so um, while while this move is surrounding more area and a move at A would be safer um, while the two moves would lead to a completely com- different game um, the end result might be very similar like it would be um, a different completely different game with a similar difference in territory hmm. And so it's really hard to say which was the better move. Um, but this, this allows White a little room to, to j- dive in. And it's really exciting seeing these attachments. Yes. And they actually yes. work. Um, now, Black's strongest move here would be to cut the local move. Mm-hmm. And White would extend once. 
and black can, um, and of course, for the time being, white is looking at this forcing move on the left, which could co cause trouble. So black has to cover from that side. And black has captured these stumps. Um, like if white plays something like this to extend liberties, um, even if white can use something on the left, there, white has too many cutting points. Like even if white plays here and here. No, no, I can't, that's. It's not working. White doesn't have white, enough that's, that's, that's not, okay, yeah, yeah, sorry. Got it's it. It's just not yeah. working for white. Right. But actually in this position, white has the extra of an Atari here. White has this, white can reduce black's territory with this move in this case. So white's gonna do the opposite. White's gonna throw everything away. And um, I just put this in to, to make it obvious what's happening. But white has this forcing move and then can live in the corner. Nice. So white has, white has taken away most of the corner from black. Black still has moves like this. Black could get some of the corner back, but um, it looks like white, white's gonna get some side territory, for instance, something like that. Um, actually, white might play an Atari. Um, maybe I should change that to white playing here and, and something like this. Um, so something like this could happen. And, mm. and white also has white also has this move on the left, which will reduce black's territory a little bit in the center. And so this is what white plans to do. And the way black handles that is very instructive because um, black, uh, sorry, I've jumped ahead a little bit. Instead of uh, answering directly, black just takes this one. Oh, wow. So that has gotten rid of the reducing, reducing yeah, move here. Yeah. So um, that's taken away a big ending move uh, from white. And also when black doesn't do anything active here, it turns out that playing from this side is just not going to work because um, it's a completely different scene here. It's just not wow. working. So not only has black gotten rid of, um, rid of this point for white, it's also dip more difficult for white to accomplish mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. So just um, stopping the opponent from doing anything by um, sort of doing nothing oneself is interesting. I would never it's have thought very, that. But white plays the double honey and um, invites a co. So on this co, white doesn't really have any co threats throughout the board. Um, maybe a, a co threat is still in the upper right corner. Um, but at least white could use co threats such as C. So um, it looks like it's a co that maybe it's good for black to avoid this co. So that's what Shua did. And he just allows white to live making it really easy for white. Like he, he's not even trying to kill. And we get to this position where white has a completely live shape. Um, but when I look at it now, I can see that black's territory is just switched to the right side, the lower right corner. And it's an even trade. I'd, I'd say it's, um, I would um, sort of say that uh, I think it's perfect play by both sides, um, ah. starting from white's invasion at, at B. Um, it's... But that's just because I can't find anything better. <laughs> but maybe I'm right. <laughs> I'm voting for you. I, I mean, the, the the play by White is really, I think, you know, all of our viewers. I mean, I'm I'm just really. I mean, when I try and do that, of course, things just, you know. It would be very easy to die inside that. Oh, that let me yeah. tell you, <laughs> yeah. I could find five ways to die there easily. But it's it's beautiful, I, I, and I and I love that black move on the left, which would never have occurred to me. The capture move, yeah. Yeah, not a, no way. Okay, we're reaching the end game, but actually, mm -hmm. I still have some stuff to talk about. Yeah. Some, some, some. Uh, so this attachment here on the second line is an exquisite move, because. Um, for one thing, if black connects at A, white's gonna finish. This is the game variation. If, if white, if black connects here, white's gonna finish the call. And white has created the connection at C. So if white had played this attachment after finishing the call, black's best move would be to come down here to cut it off. Mm -hmm. And if white cuts black and capture, this is a, a famous, uh, the clamping Tesuji yes. captures white. Yep, yep. But it turns out I, I'm going to play this. This move is probably better not played, but it makes it a lot easier for me to explain. So I'm putting that stone in. And it turns out that now white has already won the semi. Um, because if black takes, for instance, and white plays here, black gets that extra liberty. Um, but 
at this point, black has no way of filling liberty. Playing here would be putting oneself in a target. Yeah, 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 so yeah, yeah. The fact that black has to back up here means that black has uh, already lost the semi, and and that's that that's why white gets to play this this huge endgame move at d2. It, it's it's the biggest move on the board. Um, it's a very big move. So this was perfectly timed at a point where white is about ready to finish the call. Yeah. Um, asking whether black is going to connect, which gives white that connection at C. Or is black going to come down here, which is locally um, the better move for defending black's territory, but it's going to actually give white center. Uh, and again, uh, covering at A17 there is losing a point. So it's, it's a move that white doesn't want to hurry to play, but it, it really helps me demonstrate that white's going to win the semi. So that's wow. why I put that move in there. So this was exquisite, and it, it actually was a big gain compared to not playing that move. It, it gained uh, several points in the corner. So it was a very important move that made this such a close game. And Black does take the big Yosef. Black had to get to this Yosef. That's why, that's why we have this. Uh, and now White's going to start another co and upper left. But this <laughs> is a flower viewing co. It's a co where Black's whole group is, in, is if Black loses the co, then Black could die. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's a code that Black's going to back out of eventually. So Black plays peacefully. Um, black can capture two stones. Like if White connects at A, Black's alive with B. Uh, otherwise, Black can capture the two stones for the play at C. So it's a double co in the corner there. Uh -huh. um, so White continues with endgame moves. Um, so it just occurred to me, Michael, this is another sort of similarity with uh, AlphaGo is just when you think everything is, you know, going into endgame, whoop, nope, there is a... <laughs> another co-starting. <laughs> and so, so White White needed this move, actually, because um, if White just played some random endgame, Black could start another co here. Aye, aye, aye. So, so White needed to protect it. Uh, at, that's O6. And so, right. so now, now it looks like the game is going to end peacefully. But it looks no, that way. No, it's not going to happen. <laughs> so, um, so we're ending the game. Um, it's perfect end game play, of course. Um, not only AlphaGo plays perfectly in the end game. In, in ancient games, they had uh, sufficient time to think about it and play perfect moves. So this is where White makes uh, quote unquote it's White's mistake. And so a lot of debate has been about this move, whether it was a genuine mistake or was just um, Gaon just playing this because he knew he was losing anyway. A very oh, alpha goal like alpha question. Goal, yeah. buddy. Yes. <laughs> yes, you like this, don't you? Yeah, it's very similar to what AlphaGo did because um, on studying this end game, it turns out um, the correct move is well, white has all of these one-point moves like this one and stuff that white could play. Uh, maybe white should play them fairly soon. Um, white could play a few forcing moves, but by far this is the largest endgame move. Mm -hmm. So white would play here. We would continue the endgame. Uh, we have the question of this co-end upper left, which is probably not going to happen. Um, but um, it's pretty likely that black is going to win by one. As far as I can tell, black's going to win by one point. If we just have a mundane endgame, which of course they both know, I would assume so. Nothing there is that. Good. There is the uh, question of can White play this co to start with? It looks very dangerous for White when Black has co threats um, against White in the on the right side, for instance. Um, so maybe maybe White's not going to be able to do that. But if White could play this co and then connect all the stones, then it would be a G goal. Mm. Um, but that would it would take a lot of doing because white would have to just uh, even if black answered here white would have to leave it until the end of the game and then be able to win the call and connect here and then win the call again and connect here it would take a lot of doing it seems yeah. unlikely to me i haven't yeah. really gone into detailed study of that but it seems very unlikely so black's probably going to win by one point okay and so people who like Ginron, and, and a lot of professionals do i i sort of like him um, even though he's uh, sort of the enemy of the Hoimbo school, you know, mm -hmm. I sort of, I'm sort of a, a disciple of the Hoimbo school in a way because my teacher, right. Mr. Oida, was the student of, um, uh, he was the, uh, the student of the student of 
Hoimbo suicide, the last Hoimbo. So in wow. a way, I'm a, a member of the Hoimbo. So Gao was the enemy, um, but I sort of like him anyway. Um, <laughs> a very so modern, I, a very modern approach. Yeah. So I would say he he knew he was losing, and he uh, he was pretty good at the end game. Also, he played very sharp end games, as you saw with that move he played in the upper left there, that, that mark, the mark, move I've just marked. Um, so he probably knew he was losing by one point, and he he didn't want to lose by one point again because he'd lost to Sua by one point before. Just tired so of that. Yeah, he was tired of losing by one point. So he played Whoa. this. Oh. So like I'm saying that white is black is ahead by one point in this case. It means that when white plays here, if black plays any weak move, then that's going to change things. Like if black plays something like this just to be safe, now black's going to lose. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so so black has to play strongly. Every time white does this, white is uh, this move just lost one point. Right. Uh, and these moves playing from inside black, so right. they're losing right. two points each. So but white has just lost five points. Right. And he's going to lose by six points, so it makes sense. Although they, the the end game in this game file is a bit strange, so that that's another thing where I'm suspecting the game the game record. Mm. So this this turns into um, what you might call a classical mingle problem. Yeah, I can see um, it taking shape. I can't recall exactly um, what number or whatever it would be in the classical collections of Semingle, sure. but I I can guarantee that you can find it somewhere. This is where Gan sort of gave up um, without playing the corner out. <laughs> so, so I'm going to play the corner out for you. Thank you. Thank uh, you. White covers here. Um, the relatively simple one is if white just plays the safe looking move, then white doesn't have enough space to. Um, it's just dead. So that's dead. So white plays here. Um, if black had played here, this would be good for white because white would be able to squeeze. Yes. Um, this is, um, and if black black backs off, this is just a lie. Yeah. Um, so let's have black um, black play here. Let's see what what happens with this one. Uh, this looks like it could be a co at least. Um, white doesn't quite get a double co, I guess, um, because this would black would just play this side. It would still be a co. But of course, a co is a great success. For oh yeah, absolutely. So um, so black will actually push through here. Uh -huh. Now this looks like white has enough space. Like if that white just plays some some simple move like this, white's going to play here. Uh, black has cannot reduce white to one one eye. White has uh, two eyes. Right, right, right. So as far as space is concerned, it looks okay for white. But this is the vital point here. Yep, yep, gotta be. Now this is starting to look like a seki, but it's not. Now usually white would play here, but this would just be a dead shape. I'm going to talk about that later. There's a tricky move where white can throw in here. Mm -hmm. Maybe you would be fooled by this move. Um... You would want to take here, but this would give white a call. Uh, this move would be answered by this one. Ah, there you see. Okay, if right, black, right. Then, then white gets this call in the corner. So that would be a call. But and it turns great. out there's this spectacular move, which. Um, Again, I regret that I cannot, uh, I don't remember exactly. Oh, where I've seen, I have seen this problem. But I bet you've seen I it in a seen this problem. problem. I have, yep, yep, yep. Because yeah, I remember that, is, that move, yeah. that's the answer. Like this position would be very, very difficult um, if seeing it the first time. Especially if you were under time pressure and end game, right, forget yeah. about it. But for professional players, this is hardwired because we've, um, on the way to becoming professionals, everyone has done this. The classical triangle <laughs> problem. So we all have studied these shapes that are in the classical problems that have been around for hundreds of years at least. Right. Some of them, well, some of the greatest classical triangle selections came from ancient China. Uh -huh. so, um, so, so they've been around maybe longer than. Her. And so in this case, obviously, to, if white takes, it's going to be a false eye. So yeah. white connects, black takes. And the point is, white has to react here because white's an Atari. Atari, only, sure, sure. The only good move is to take that. And so now we get this shape, which actually um, is still hard to understand, probably. But it's go going to be a bent four in the corner because yeah. white plays here. Um, eventually, just to simplify things, black doesn't have to play any more moves, but this is right. what's going to happen. 
um, eventually white's going to have to take here because like even if white plays away, um, black will be able to play an Atari from outside. So locally, this is the position we end up with. Yeah. Or, the, or this one. Well, it's easier if we have the, um, just as far as a, a life and death problem is concerned, this is what we end up with. And one might still ask, is that not a Seki? Because there's no legal move for, there's no good move for white. White would not want to play here and get killed. So there's no good move for, for white. And what about black? It turns out that black at his leisure, um, let's just play another meaningless move for white. At his leisure, black can play here and then play here. And this is going to be a co. But the point is, uh, the game black, is down. Decides, black decides when to play. Right. And so black, uh, theoretically, black can get rid of all of white's co threats and then play. Right. Right. And like in the Chinese rules, they would finish the game and then black would erase all the threats and then play this code. In yeah. actual practice, it would work. Same as, it, well, in the Japanese rules, um, it doesn't really work that way. and They've just ruled it as a dead shape. So it dies as it is. At this, in this shape, it's already considered to be dead. Or if you go back to the game, in this shape, um, so... white already realize, yeah. Yeah, well, I just have a stupid. I have a stupid question, so since we have since we had some stupid moves, I have a stupid question, um, which is he knows this. He knows yeah. this before he plays the first move. There's no time pressure. There's this is this is. I mean, it's, it's, it, and, like I said, it's hardwired. Yeah. Right. So there's so yeah. so why? Now, um, it's like um, giving up um, decoratively. <laughs> would you it, but it um it doesn't really make sense to me in a way no because um in that case the way i would do it maybe if i wanted to just die here and resign because i knew i was going to win by lose by one point anyway okay i would i would be playing up to this point and saying i'm dead i would resign the game that would be the point of playing this out so that's the argument for people who say that Ganon misread that or had, uh, a, um, had a blind spot, maybe. Uh -huh. uh, the argument for that is the fact that he actually played the whole end game out. Uh, because oh, maybe they just didn't put it in the record. Maybe they just maybe they actually played out, but they decided to give. I'm I'm I'm, I'm just trying to help <laughs> yeah, him out here. <laughs> yeah, you're trying to help him out. So this is <laughs> this is the way the game would end. Probably having Black show his special move and then then resigning. That's cool. Uh, I like that. That 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 would that. be a that would be a way to set up a resignation, um, a kind of a decorative resignation. Yeah, it would be more maybe for some players it would be more satisfying than um, not doing that and playing the end game out without playing any of those bad moves. So so just to play this end game out, mm -hmm. and just play all these. Um, not show so people, show oh, people yeah. that it's. I think it's obvious to you, but show people why uh, what happens. Why can't get through? Uh, black covers, and, yeah. and like like um, as far as shape is concerned, it's not very satisfying to be playing these moves anyway. White would end up playing this move, and the end game would end with black winning by one point. Yeah, uh, that's that's how I would finish the game. Yeah, I don't really I don't really go for those um, those resignations. This, the, the, the spectacular um, I, ones. Yeah, I don't go for the spectacular resignations. I don't really <laughs> get any. Um, I don't get a kick out of it. Uh, but the people who do that would probably take it to this point and then resign. Right. Um, yeah, feeling that they'd at least given it a shot and, and you know. Well, you know, um, people look at Go as a kind of a work of art, especially professionals. It's not just a game. It's not just a competition. Uh, they want to create something. And sure. they have the belief that they're creating something with the um, participation of their opponent. And so uh, people who like to resign when they know they're going to lose, and, and even if it's, well, I would say a one-point difference is close enough for me to play to the end. But um, the kind of person who would like to resign that game would want to show uh, a, a piece of art, which would be this Smigel problem completely. Um, although conceivably, you could leave it at this point and, and make it kind of a challenge to the reader. Yeah. Um, yeah. it would be a bit steep for most amateur players 
unless you've done all of the classic Tamigo problems. <laughs> no, it is. No, I, I, I know that now that yeah. you had mentioned it, I, I know that because it looks at first like such an easy, it's like pff, mm. white, white just doesn't have room, but it actually is a problem with a lot of depth, yeah, well, a it's, lot it's of like, depth. Yeah, there's a lot of area for black to make mistakes. Like uh, a weak player would just play the cut here and, and allow mm -hmm. white to live or get a call. Um, so what a treat. This, this would also be a way to finish the game and just leave this big question mark there for the reader. Mm -hmm. um, but if the reader is an amateur player um, and did not know this particular Tsumigo, it would be very, very difficult to have that player to figure it out. I think. Would that be um, kind of, and, and this in fact is where the game ends, right? No, he played to the end. He finished the game. Oh, he really? Oh, oh I'm sorry. I misunderstood. I, I thought you said So that, that's, that's why I sort of question question it um yeah he did, when he does finish the game it, it seems strange that it's um that he, he played that in the lower right corner but he, he lost by six points and actually just... uh this game record is, is is again it's a bit strange uh let's see if i can find the move let's uh this move here uh this move by black actually loses a point because black should play here to get an extra point there and that's just all right it's, it's it's not a this is something that I found. Yeah, of course. Um, I, I actually used this game to study end games. Um and so I I I did did work out this end game and I was getting the correct answer. But you know here. But you know what? That's right next to that other move that you were suspect. And I think there may be yeah, a problem so something there. Strange happening something there. strange yeah. happening there. So in this game record, actually when I counted it using um counting this is really a headache if you're doing it <laughs> the old fashioned way. But um, we have computer programs nowadays. Yes, so we I do. It with a, I use the tool on my computer program, and it turns out that in this end game, White can win the call, uh, obviously, because White has all these co threats in the lower right. And um, White's going to lose by only five points. And that's because uh, Black A was not played at B. Right. So there's, that's another point where I'm pretty sure the game record is incorrect. Yeah. Wow. So there are yeah, so there's some problems with the game record, but it's a beautiful game anyway. It is a gorgeous game. And and I'm I'm with you. I actually I actually uh, I'm a huge Sumego fan. Um mm -hmm. and I mean one thing every pro that I've ever asked has always told me to study you know Sumego. So yeah. uh, but it, it is kind of a nice gift at the end there to uh mm -hmm. to have a, a, a classic uh go problem there. So thank you for that. That's that's a very that's a that's a real treat. The whole game uh, and all of the history was a real treat, and and uh, just seeing the similarity uh, with with that other game that we were just looking at from AlphaGo um, is it? There we go. We have yeah, Doug. Yeah, say hello. We have yeah. Doug. Hey, happy yeah, New Year. Hey, <laughs> he's like, all right, yeah. we're done. It was time for him to get off. Yeah, yeah. he's probably it's probably time for him to eat, and uh, so oh, we he already let... had his breakfast. But yeah, he has. Okay, yeah. all right. Uh, well, we're going to wrap up here. Thank you for this just amazing and fascinating journey into Go history, Michael. I know that uh, you really enjoyed it, and I'm sure our viewers did as well. Uh, thanks, of course, uh, once more to our AGA members who make all these videos possible. Thank you. Uh, and just a reminder that if you'd like to support this content, and we hope that you do, please consider joining the American Go Association. You just go over to usgo.org. Takes a couple of minutes, lots of other cool stuff there. We appreciate it, uh, Michael and I both, and all of the folks at the AGA. And we will see you all next week.